بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا مولانا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك وعلمنا من لدنك علما ينفعنا في الدين والدنيا يا كريم إن شاء الله إذا the voice is clear enough we should use the microphone it's good إن شاء الله it's clear okay so الحمد لله uh, today I believe this class is the Subhanallah the yeah, it's a 27th class that um, we are taking uh, in the book of Abu Shuja. And inshallah ta'ala, from next week, we will start, and we'll also advertise again, inshallah, we'll start from Kitab al-Nikah. So we'll do it slowly and do all the details, inshallah. This is the end of uh, the transactions other than Nikah. Nikah is also a transaction, but it's uh, the end of the financial uh, the transactions of fiqh. Which, uh, as we saw, there are so many of them. There's so many details to go through. We just touched on the most important parts, inshallah ta'ala. So, um, the next section that we are taking with today, inshallah ta'ala, is what is known as waqf. And there's no English word that can explain what waqf is. That's why in Arabic I say it's tahbisu al-asl wa tasbilu al-manfa'a, meaning that uh, you have an item and you restrict the uh, original item so that no one can uh, own it anymore. It basically, it's uh, tahbis means to stop it, to hold it down, to pull it, to restrict the or origin of the item and then to let the benefit of that item be um, opened or be shared with people. So uh, in the past, as we'll take inshallah ta'ala, Waqf was a very big concept in Islam, and uh, we had many examples of waqf. So there would be like, um, you know, places that were dedicated for certain groups of people to sleep in. Uh, it could be for students of knowledge, scholars, for people um, traveling between cities, for example. And it used to actually, like we'll take in Shalat it used to fix a lot of the problems in the um, in the society. And so the Prophet used to encourage things like this, as we'll take in Shalat so Abu Shuja, he says, Faslun, wal waqfu, jaizun, bithalata fi shara'it, an yakuna mimma yuntafa'u bihi ma'a baqa'i aynihi, wa an yakuna ala aslin mawjudin, wa far'in la yantata', wa an la yakuna fi mahbur, wa huwa ala ma sharaf wa waqif, min taqdeemin wa ta'khirin wa taswiyatin wa tafsir. An endowment is permissible provided three conditions by men. A, it is something that can be benefited from without being consumed. The benefit is lawful. B, initial recipient exists and that the future recipient be perpetual. C, it is not something unlawful. The endowment must comply with the endowed conditions, including one, making some recipients eligible before others, and two, giving recipients equal or unequal treatment. So, um, the um, Chef Musa. Um, Allah Ta'ala bless him. He, he translated waqf as endowment. Okay, and we just explained what it is. As we mentioned, waqf is one of the most important acts of worship. It's an act of ibadah to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And like we said, that there's many examples of waqf in Islamic history. Not many remain today. There's some examples in Muslim countries, but there's not that many. Uh, and SubhanAllah, a lot of the scholars that we, we read their books today, they were only able to survive and to, um, subhanAllah, to, to flourish because of waqf. They would live off waqf. The food, the housing would come from waqf, basically. So waqf is, 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 is kind of a system where you don't have to put your hands up to people's help. It's opened, yeah? And uh, the person who began that waqf might have even passed away. So subhanAllah, uh, like you said, it fixed many major problems in the society. And uh, subhanAllah, waqf, it's not mentioned clearly in the Quran, but there is an ayah in the Quran that kind of uh, relates to waqf. So, uh, uh, Allah Ta'ala says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ Okay? Uh, uh, in um, in Surah Al-Imran. Okay? You won't reach bir. 
you won't reach that high level of being a you know a thankful proper slave until you spend from the most beloved things to you okay so when this ayah was sent down uh sayyidina abu talha or sayyidina talha uh, came to the prophet went to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay and he said ya rasulullah allah ta'ala says in the quran lan tanalu al-birra hatta tuhib allah says this ayah in the quran and bayruha uh okay there's, there's a there's a whole farm for uh, date trees is the most beloved wealth that I have uh, when it comes to me, and it's visibility. Prophet Muhammad, what he say? He said to uh, basically dedicate it and make it specific so that, uh, subhanAllah, you know, um, certain people could eat from it. So basically, do waqf to it, basically. Okay? So the, ident- the definition of waqf is to hold or to restrict an item so that it can uh, um, it cannot be used in any transaction. People can't buy it and sell it. Anymore. Okay? And people can benefit from it. So they can continue to benefit from it. A person doing waqf must own the item, of course, that they are uh, putting down as waqf. This is the most important uh, condition here, is that you have full authority and ownership over the item. So if I want to make my telephone, my, my mobile phone waqf, for example, I could, I could, yeah? So this phone now, uh, I could say that it's waqf, for example, okay? For everyone in the desk. Anyone inside the desk, they have an emergency, they can use the phone to call someone, okay? The phone is something that is ongoing, something that people can benefit from for a while. It doesn't uh, disappear immediately. Uh, okay, and I could dedicate it to the people I want. Okay, I could say, for example, the students uh, who have been coming for a long time, they have certain you know, use to the phone. Other people can use it in certain circumstances. I could, I could make my own conditions according to what I feel is, uh, you know, uh, benefits and helps people. Um, so, um, uh, like we said, it's acceptable for a person to make their own, uh, 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 to make work uh, with whatever they own, and as long as they're not restricted in their money. In fiqh, we said that there are certain people in fiqh who are restricted in their money. They're not allowed to use their money in all circumstances, okay? We took that uh, earlier on in fiqh, okay? The, uh, a person like that, uh, you know, there's restriction on them, uh, but if someone has full authority over their own wealth, then they can. They could put their wealth in work. Um, also, if a non-Muslim makes a, a building into a masjid, okay, uh, it's also accepted from them. They could make work. So work is not only for Muslims. If a non-Muslim government says, you know, I want to make work, for example, okay, I want to dedicate this this money to a masjid for the Muslims that's ongoing, and it will be owned by all the Muslims. It's not owned by anyone specific. Then they could do that as long as they don't see it to be an act of worship for themselves, because Acts of worship, they require intention. And intention, uh, the condition of intention is Islam. Okay. Some of the most important rulings that Abu Shujaq touched on. Uh, one of the conditions is that the item being established as waqf must not be haram. Must not be haram. Okay. Uh, for example, if someone wants to build a church as waqf. Okay. In the church, that will be used for haram acts. For worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not permissible to make that place as waqf. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, also, the person or the people the works being established for, okay, they should be able to own that item if it was given to them other than work. Okay. So if you're not allowed to own this item I'm giving you, then uh, okay, you might not be eligible for it to be a work upon you. Okay. Uh, there's very few examples for this. Work, for example, cannot be done. For a baby that's not born yet. Okay. Now, uh, why? Uh, okay. Or oh, someone who's passed away already. Okay. I'm doing work on people who already passed away. Uh, a Muslim slave can't be given as work to a non Muslim because non Muslims, they can't, you can't sell Muslim slaves to them. Okay. Because it's a way of humiliating a Muslim basically in their religion. Uh, those examples don't really occur much, but uh, they mention them. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. So um, now also the scholars mentioned that a uh, uh cannot be done for an animal that is owned because animals do not own anything. Okay. Unless waqf is given to the animals, but the intention it is that it's 
given to the owner of the animals to use for the animals, basically, okay? But not given to the animals. Wok can't be owned by animals. Animals can't buy and sell. So you can't give a wok to them, basically, okay? But you can give it to the owner of the animal to use for the animals, for example. Um, uh, of course, animals, like I said, um, uh, um, that are not owned, but are wok for courses can be used in battle. And they can also have wok dedicated to them because it's considered fisa lillah. Um, the item given in waqt must be specific, must be a specific item. So the item given in waqt, uh, you know, we can't say I'm going to get something, bismillah, yeah? It has to be specific. I'm going to build this house, this masjid, this book, and give it bismillah. Um, okay, it, um, uh, also, uh, it must be uh, an item that can be transferred to others, okay? Uh, so um, in fiqh, there's uh, a section called al-mustawlada, which is a slave girl who has given birth to her master's child. Okay, um, this person, the moment the master passes away, becomes free. Okay, so that person, um, there's restrictions on them; they can't be bought and sold like other people, uh, and that's why they can't be given in uh, uh Also. Um, it must be something that has benefit, even if it benefits in the future. Okay, so for example, a small little donkey right now, you can't ride it, you can't use it much, but we know that donkey will grow up and become very beneficial in the future. You could use it as a walk, you could put it down as a walk because this will be used in the future. In a few months, it'll grow up, it'll be strong. Okay, um, so as long as there's going to be benefit from it in the future, then uh, you can you know, put it down as a um, and the benefit of the item has to be ongoing for at least a short period of time. It can't end immediately. So um, how long does it have to be able to be there for it to be locked? Uh, what? They say as, it should be as long as something can be rented in Islam. So um, you can't put an apple up there for locked and people will eat it in one minute and it will be finished. Yeah? Like you can't rent an apple, the same thing we said. You can't rent food for people to eat because it finishes. It's not ongoing. Uh, but if I put my phone down as well, yes, it might be wrecked one day, but it will be ongoing for at least a year or a few months, so that's fine. I could put it down as well. So generally, anything that's halal, owned by you, and it has benefit that's ongoing, you can put it down as well. There's not much details to work, other than that, the restrictions are, are very limited, like we mentioned. And that is the most important details uh, that we, we can cover in Waqt, inshallah ta'ala. Abu Shuja then goes on to gifts. Okay, so there's a bit of difference between Waqt and gift, gifts. Something that's given specifically to a person, he says, Faslun wa kullu ma jaza bi'u jaza hibatuhu. So gifts in Arabic are known as, in Ithaq are known as hiba, as al hiba. Wa la talzamu al hibatu illa bil qabl, wa ila qabdaha al muhubu lahu, lam yakun lil wahibi an yarja fiha illa an yakuna walidan, wa ila a'mara shay'an aw arqabahu, kana lil mu'amari aw lil murqabi, aw lil murqabi, wa li warathatihi min ba'di. Everything that is permissible to sell is permissible to offer as a gift. The gift does not become binding until the recipient takes possession of it. Once the recipient takes possession, the one who offered it cannot re renew it, except in the case of a card of taking that gift of the time. If someone gives someone something for as long as he lives, or says, if I die first, this is yours, it belongs to the person's dress or his hairs. So, gifts or hiba, uh, basically the definition of it is that it's voluntarily giving others ownership of something in one's lifetime, okay? If you give it to someone after your death, that's a different section of them, okay? But uh, hiba in Arabic means to give someone and make it make an item their ownership in your life, lifetime while you're alive, okay? So they say, tamliku tafawu'in fi halat al -haya. While you're alive, you give something to someone else permanently, while you are alive, that you are. Okay, that's what gifting is in fiqh. Of course, gift, gifting is a transaction. It uh, requires accepting from the person on the other side, okay? And there's a lot of conditions to it. Um, so there's a few uh, difference between uh, sadaqah, okay? Sadaqah and hiba and hadiyah. So hadiyah is uh, basically a general gifting. Um, hiba um, uh, uh, is what we're studying here. And sadaqa is, uh, you know, kind of uh, like um, uh, basically donation. So, hadiyah 
is when you give someone else the ownership of something while you're alive uh, with the intention of honoring that person. Okay? Uh, and sadaqah is to give something to someone else uh, for the sake of reward or because that person is in need. Uh, okay, that's the definition of sadaqah. And the hiba we're studying here is to give someone something to someone else while you're alive with uh, both sides uh, having a transaction. So there's agreement and exception. There's an offer and exception, basically. Uh, ijab and qabul that happens here. Uh, and it's um, uh, it has a lot more conditions than than uh, that we were going to mention. Inshallah. So basically, the scholars say, if you give something to someone uh, just out of reward, okay, but you use the wording that we say, okay, you say I give this to you. They say I've accepted your gift. Then it's considered both uh, um, uh, sadaqa because your intention is reward. And it's also considered a hibah because you use the wording of hibah. Just like we said here. If you gift something to someone to honor them and you use the wording, you say this is a gift to you, but your intention is to honor them, then it's considered a gift and also a hadiyah. Also, uh, so it's considered both of them. If you give something to someone else uh, for reward and also to honor them, okay, uh, Sorry, if you give something to someone else uh, uh, for reward and you use that, um, I'm sorry, if you give something to someone else without intention of reward, without intention of earning, earning them, but you use the word I gift you, uh, then it's considered hibah, like we're taking here. Now, if you don't have a certain wording that you use, you just give it to them, okay, then if it's done for reward, it's considered sadaqah. If it's done to honor the person, it's considered a hadith. Okay, it's considered a hadiyah, not a hibah. Hibah is what we're studying in fiqh, and it's a transaction that requires a person to accept uh, the gift. Okay. A person gifting a gift to others must have the same conditions as a person selling an item that we took in Buyur. Uh, they must be mature in their full mind. Uh, Okay, and they must not be forced to give the item to someone else. These are the most important conditions of a person gifting something to someone else. A person uh, being gifted must be eligible to receive items in Islam. Okay, so they can't be a slave. A slave in Islam does not own anything. Okay, they can't be an animal, for example, because they don't own anything. Okay, uh, an item being gifted. Uh, must have the general conditions that we studied uh, when it comes to an item being sold. It must be beneficial item, it must be halal, it must be pure. Uh, okay, one of the exemptions and the differences between selling something and gifting something is that we studied in the rulings of selling that if you were to sell one grain of rice or two grains of rice, for example, it doesn't count because the benefit of that is very uh, minimum. You can gift something like that um, uh, because gifting really, uh, you're not taking anything in exchange, so it doesn't matter. Um, so um, uh, also, just like we took in selling, a person who is blind cannot give other other things to other people, nor can they receive gifts. Just like they can't buy and sell, why? Because they don't know the item that they are that they're receiving Islam. Just like we studied in the book of uh, Buyur. Um, now. A gift does not transfer to the ownership of the person it is gifted to until that person physically takes it and accepts it. Okay? So before the gift uh, uh, is uh, received from the other side, okay, uh, the original, uh, so it basically, when it's still in the ownership of the original owner, uh, the, um, the owner still owns that gift. Uh, even if, I, if someone says to a person, I'm going to give you this, okay? I promise you I'm going to give you a car, for example, okay? I'm gifting you a car. Until you have received that, you don't own it. It's still owned by that person. And one of the examples of this is the Prophet Sallam, uh, he sent gifts to an Najashi in Abyssinia, okay? And uh, an Najashi was very far away, 
and he passed away before the gift had reached him. So in one narration, Prophet said to Aisha radiallahu anha, he said, I believe our gifts are going to, or he said, our gifts are going to return to us. So because they didn't reach Najafi yet, he didn't, he didn't earn the gifts. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he gifted great date trees to Aisha in his life, and she didn't physically take them. So when he was on his deathbed, he said, those trees are going to be inherited. Why? Because she didn't take them. She didn't, uh, you know, take ownership over them yet. Of course, in the Shafi'i Madhab, verbally, uh, exception is also a condition. So you have to say, I have accepted the gift, uh, just like we studied in uh, all the other sections uh, of the uh, Imam Abu Shuja, he now goes to a very, very important section, which is known as Al Luqafah. He says, Faslun wa ida wajada lukatatan fi mawatin, au fi tariqin, falahu akhduha wa tarkuha, wa akhduha awla min tarkiha, in kana ala thikatin min al qiyami biha. وَإِذَا أَخَذَهَا فَعَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَعْرِفَ سِتَّةَ أَشْيَاءَ وِعَاءَهَا وَعِفَاصَهَا وَوِكَاءَهَا وَجِنْسَهَا وَعَدَدَهَا وَزْنَهَا وَيَحْفَظَهَا فِي حِرْزِ مِثْلِهَا ثُمَّ إِذَا أَرَادَ تَمَلُّكُهَا عَرَّفَهَا سَنَةً عَلَى أَبْوَابِ الْمَسَاجِدِ وَفِي الْمَوَاضِعِ الَّتِي الموضع الذي وجدها, وجدها فيه فإن لم يجد صاحبها كان له أن يتملكها بشرط الضمان واللقطة على أربعة أضرب أحدها ما يبقى على الدوام فهذا حكمه والثاني ما لا يبقى في الطعام والرطب فهو مخير بين أكله وغرمه أو بيعه وحفظ ثمنه والثالث ما يبقى بعلاج كالرطب فيفعل ما فيه المصلحة من بيعه وحفظ ثمنه أو تجفيفه وحفظه والرابع ما يحتاج إلى نفقة كالحيوان وضربان حيوان لا يمتنع بنفسه وهو مخير بين أكله وغرم مثله أو تركه وتطوع بالإنفاق عليه أو بيعه وحفظ ثمنه وحيوان يمتنع بنفسه فإن وجده في الصحراء تركه وإن وجده في الحضر فهو مخير بين الأشياء الثلاثة فيه. If one finds a lost item in uninhabited land or on a farm, he may replace it or leave it. Taking it is better than leaving it if one is sure that he is trustworthy enough to take care of it. If one takes the item, he must know six things about the item. One must know the item's exterior, cover, stitching, size, quantity, and weight. It must be safely guarded in a place typical for its protection. If one wants to receive ownership of the item, he must publicize the item for one year. One does so on the doors of the, of the mosque, but not inside, and in the vicinity in which the item is found. If its founder is, if its owner is not found, one is entitled to assume ownership provided one guarantees the item should the owner later approve. Found items are of four types. One, non-perishable items, the ruling is mentioned above. Number two, perishable items such as foodstuffs, foodstuffs and rice, but not yet dried dates. One chooses between eating the item and paying the price or selling the item and saving the money for its own. Number three, items that can be preserved with treatment such as ripe dates. One does whatever is in the best interest of the owner. This includes selling the item, saving money, or drying the item, keeping it in storage. Four, items that require upkeep and maintenance, like animals. These items are of two types. One, animals that do not fend for themselves. One chooses between, one, eating the animal and paying its price. Two, not eating it and voluntarily taking care of it. And number two, selling it and saving the money. Part two, animals that fend for themselves. If one finds such an animal in the desert, it is left alone. If one finds it in, in an inhabited, inhabited area, one chooses between the three options mentioned above. Okay. So, <clears throat> lukata means lost items. Okay. Or items that can be picked up. So, so in Arabic, yaltaqib means to pick something up. Yeah. Um, so, the definition of it in fiqh. Uh, is that it is a respected belonging of others. So some things in Fiqh are not respected, okay? A respected belonging of others found in a land that is not owned by anyone. Okay, while the owner of the item is unknown. Okay. So you're on you're on the main highway, you're on the road, for example. Okay. A place that's not owned by anyone. 
and you find someone's phone, someone's wallet, something like that, okay? Uh, you don't know who the owner is, okay? That is considered a lookup, okay? The specific rulings for this thing. It's not like you go into someone's house, and you find the phone on the desk, and you say, you know what? Um, it's look up. I'm going to... And you know the person's not going to be around for a year, so you say, you know what? I'm going to use it. And look for a person for a year, and then you take it. It has to be found in a place that is not owned by anyone, not someone else's uh, you know, house or belonging. Just because you find something that you don't know if it belongs to anyone in someone else's house, you can't just take it, yeah? But if it's in abandoned land, like you took abandoned lands, it's in a, it's in a main road, it's in an area where no one owns it, then uh, it's considered local. Okay? Now, if you find a lost item, like I said, on the road or on abandoned land, um, there are different conditions with, uh, whether, whether you should take it or not. Okay? So if you know that you will not be uh, uh, trustworthy regarding the item, okay, so you know that you're going to take it now, and you're not going to give it back to anyone. You know you're going to you're going to you're going to you're going to be un un untrustworthy with the item. Then it's haram to take the item. Okay. If you don't know that you will be untrustworthy with the item, okay, but you know that by leaving the item behind, you'll get lost, then it's compulsory to take the item. It's compulsory to take the item because you have to save the wealth of the people. You can't just let things get lost. If you don't know that it will get lost and you trust yourself, so you're not sure it will be lost, maybe it won't get lost, but you trust yourself, then it's recommended to take the item. It's not compulsory, but it's recommended soon. Um, if you are sure about your trustworthiness, trustworthiness in the current time, but you're not sure about the future, okay? So you might, you know, you, you, you know that you might change in the future, then it's permissible to take it. It's dislike to take it if you're sure about your trustworthiness in the current time. But you, uh, you know, um, you're sure about your untrustworthiness in the future, then it's dislike to take it because you'll be uh, putting yourself under the risk of falling into haram. Uh, if a person uh, doesn't take the item at all, even if it's compulsory to take it, then you are not responsible even if it gets lost. Okay, so no one can hold you accountable Islamically and say now you have to pay back for the item that you saw because you didn't take it. You're not responsible, even though it's haram to leave it in some circumstances. Still. It, it, you're not responsible if you don't pick it up and take it. Once you take it, then you become responsible of it uh, as we will, we will see this picture. Okay. Who can pick up uh, items in Islam? Okay. The person must not be a slave. They can, they can, they can pick up items. Um, uh, a condition uh, uh, pick up item, it's not Islam uh, and not puberty. puberty. Okay. These are not conditions. Uh, being someone trustworthy, being someone who is adil, someone who has, you know, or the conditions of transactions, these are not conditions for picking up an item. But if a child picks up a lost item, the guardian has to take it from them, and then the guardian would declare for the item to be under the ownership of the child if they believe that is beneficial for them or not. So the guardian will take it first and then give it back to the, the child, basically, because they are the ones who, basically, uh, are in charge of the ownership of the child when it comes into certain items. Uh, if you pick up a lost item, it's recommended to do the following. Okay. Uh, to know if the item comes in a container or in a bag or something, to know the container it's kept in, to know the type of seal or the tie that was around the item that was tied with, okay. to know the category that that item belongs to, okay. the type of item that category is from. So if you, you know it's a phone, you know, also know it's an Apple iPhone, for example. Okay. Um, to know the details of the item, okay, and to know the weight or the mass of the item, right? These things are recommended to know if you want to pick up an item and save it. Okay. Um, it is compulsory to do one thing, which is to preserve the item in a safe surroundings, okay, so they won't get damaged. So you have someone else's property with you. You have to preserve it. And it's so not to know the details of the property. Okay? Now, if you want to take ownership over it, so this is now, what we just took now, 
that was regarding a person just keeping it in their house. But if you want to take ownership of it, there's more conditions. Okay. If you want to take ownership of that item, all the conditions, all the recommended matters we mentioned, they become compulsory. If you want to take ownership, then no, it's compulsory to know um, the container, the seal, the category, the type, the details, and the, the weight of the asset item. It's compulsory to know this. Yeah, the details that would affect the item. If you want to take ownership, that's the first thing. Second thing, to advertise the missing item for a year, for a whole year, in the place that it was lost, and they say at the doors of the masajid and place of gatherings, like the market shops, where people would generally be. Where would you find people? You go to these places and you advertise for a year. Okay. Now, this changes according to people's customs and norms. So you don't have to spend the whole entire year 24-7 advertising. You've got someone's phone and you, just, you stand there for a year and you put a tent up and just all year you're just advertising. Yeah, it's not how it works. Okay. Uh, they say that gradually it changes. So you start at the beginning, you should advertise twice a day. Yeah. In the morning and the afternoon. And then uh, that would be for one week. Then for a week or two, you would advertise once a day. And then it would be once or twice a week. Then once or twice a month. Okay. Then once a month. So gradually you would get less and less. Why? Because generally, khalas, people, the idea has gone around, the news has gone around, people, uh, you know, they, they get less attached to the item then. So um, you don't have to, you know, um, do the same advertising every single time. Now, uh, the only reason I say yes with the Prophet he says in the hadith, Arifatana, yeah? One of the Sahaba, he found an item, he said, he said, make sure you advertise it for a year. Now, when you're advertising, you have to mention some details of the item, but you hide other details. Why? Because sometimes if it's mine, you have to ask about the rest of the details so that no one comes and steals the other person's item. You have to be, um, you, have to be uh, you know, uh, wise here because people can, and if you say, well, you know what, there's, um, for example, someone lost money, a big sum of money, right? Um, if you don't tell them someone lost $500, $500 note. And the details you hid, is it a note? Was it, was it, was it punched up or was it, that's not, yeah? You would say someone lost money, for example, okay, in this area, a bunch of money in this area. When the person comes, you ask them, how much money did you lose? What color was the night note, for example? Okay, things like that. And then you can tell if they're lying or not. But if someone just comes up, oh, yeah, what's money? What's going to come to you, yeah? Um, so uh, a person can take ownership after one year, okay, of that item with the condition that they would replace it if the owner ever comes and asks them in their whole life. So you can take ownership, khalas. Now the phone, you've, 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 you've advertised them for a year. No one can take it. Now it can become your phone. Okay? But if the person ever comes to get it from you, then you have to replace. You have to give them back what they lost. Now, if the item has been destroyed or, you know, uh, disappeared basically, and it's mythly. We said in fiqh, there's certain things that are mythly. They have identical copies. Okay? In fiqh, they would generally say that mythly is what? Like we said, grains and stuff like that, yeah? We said now, in some cases, we could consider certain um, factory, uh, factory produced products also mythically, like things that have identical copies to the finest detail. These things can be replaced with an identical copy. Then you have to give back identical copies of these items, yeah? Uh, if not, if they're not identical, there could be some differences, then you have to give the value of the item when the day that you took ownership, okay? The day you took ownership, the value of the item that day, so you say after one year, you there's an iPhone. After one year, it costs one thousand dollars. Okay, you uh, let's say that that phone there's no identical copies of the phone, for example, then you would give them one thousand dollars back. Um, uh, to take ownership, one must also physically say, "I have taken ownership of the of this item." That's also a condition. Okay. Now, uh, all of the details we mentioned here are in regard to items that have high value, that have high value. A whole year of advertising, that's when something is very valuable, okay? If the item has no significant value, okay, there's no need to do this, okay? There's no need to do this. If the item has a value, but it's not high, okay, something that's not really expensive, then a person must advertise, but not as long 
as we mentioned, for as long as it would take people to lose hope in it and forget about it. Okay, so let's say we've got, um, for example, maybe a book or something. Um, that's you know, um, it's not very expensive. It's not very um, a unique book or something. Let's say it might take you know one or two one month or something, two months for people to to lose hope in it. خلاص, that's all you need to do. Then you can take ownership after that. The details on what items need to be kept and what need to be consumed and what don't, they are, as Abu Shuja mentioned, uh, generally, uh, we're not going to go into that detail. Most of us won't find a uh, lost camel in the middle of the desert, inshallah. But they're similar to what, similar to what Abu Shuja mentioned. So inshallah, that is all clear. And what do we want to do? Uh, so, um, actually, you know, there's, this part also, yeah, there's another part before we go into the inheritance. So Abu Shuja, he says, Fastun, he's going to talk now about finding an abandoned child. Not an abandoned item, abandoned child. Okay. So he says, Fastun, وَإِذَا وَجَدَ لَقِيْتُمْ بِقَارِعَةِ الطَّرِيقِ فَأَقَذَهُ فَأَقْذُهُ وَتَرْبِيَتُهُ وَكِفَالَتُهُ وَأَجِبَةٌ عَلَى الْكِفَاءِ وَلَا يُقَرُّ إِلَّا فِي يَدِ أَمِينٍ فَإِنْ وُجِدَ مَعَهُ مَالٌ أَنْفَقَ عَلَيْهِ الْحَاكِمُ مِنْ وَإِنْ لَمْ يُوجَدْ مَعَهُ مَالٌ فَنَفْقَتُهُ فِي بَيْتِ الْمَالِ وَالْوَدِي فَصْنُ الْوَدِيعَةُ أَمَانًا يُسْتَحَبُّ قَبُولَهَا لِمَنْ قَامَ بالأمانة فيها ولا يضمن ولا يضمن إلا بالتعدي وقول المودع مقول في ردها على وقول المودع مقبول في ردها على المودع وعليها أن يحفظها في حرز مثلها وإذا طولب بها فلم يخرجها مع القدرة عليها حتى تلفت ضمن the child is not left in the charge of anyone except someone who is trustworthy. If property is found with the child, the judge uses it to pay for the child's expenses. If no property is found with the child, the Muslim common fund Bayt al-Mal paid for the expenses. Deposits for safekeeping. A deposit put up for safekeeping is a trust, a mana. It is recommended for someone who will uphold the trust to accept it. The depositee is not held liable except when there is transgression. The depositee's word is accepted concerning returning the property to the depositor. The depositee must safeguard the property in the manner typical for the property. The depositee is liable for damages if the depositor requests the deposit's return and he delays, even though able to do so, until it has been destroyed. Okay. So, laqit means a child or someone who's not in their mind. That is fan, found abandoned. And we don't know this specific guardian. So basically, uh, in some countries, we find, and I, I think I've seen this, or I've heard in stories about it. Uh, in some Muslim countries, find you go to Fajr, pray Fajr. I believe I've seen it once, actually, subhanAllah. At the door of the masjid, you find a little box, uh, a cartoon box, cotton box, and there'll be a baby inside. What is it? Yeah, that's considered uh, okay. Yeah, we have no idea who's parents. Okay, so it's compulsory that someone takes the child. Okay, uh, if only one person finds a child, it's compulsory for them to find it. But if it's found by a group of people, then one of them must take the child. It becomes part of kifaya. At least you know some Muslim family has to take the child in and take care of the child. Okay, now. The conditions of a person taking an abandoned child is freedom. So someone who is a slave is owned by someone can't take the child. And to be Rashid. So you're in your full mind and capacity. Okay? You can conduct all types of transactions that we mentioned. Uh, and uh, someone also must be trustworthy. Not be known as for haram actions. Someone who is religious practicing, person respected. They are the people who can uh, take, uh, uh, you know, uh, can adopt uh, an abandoned child. Okay? Trustworthy non-Muslims, so they're trustworthy in their religion, they're, they're considered good people, they can adopt non-Muslims, even from other religions, as long as it's not from Islam. Okay? Now, so how do we know a child is not a Muslim? That's the question here. So basically, this can only be declared in regard if a child is found in the land that's not Muslim. Nor has land had any Muslim even passed through that land. Okay? Who could possibly be their parents? There's a Muslim there who could not possibly be their parents. Okay, it doesn't matter. 
But there's no one who could possibly be the parent who has been through that land faster than that. There's no possibility the parents are Muslim. Or they have proof that the child's not from a Muslim origin. Okay? But if there's no proof, then we originally consider the child Muslim. We consider the child Muslim. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, no. uh, so the last detail of Shah mentioned is if money is found with the abandoned child. Okay, we find a baby in a box, and then under him we find a ten thousand dollar note. So the person who left the child had a little bit of you know um, awareness and felt that I'm going to at least leave some money for the person to take care of them. Then, if the money that's found found around the abandoned child, so on top of them, under them, around them, or, or in a room that no one else was in that room, okay, if there's other abandoned children, it'll be split between them, for example, okay. Then the governor of that land uses the money to pay for the child's needs. Okay? Not the person who collected the child, the governor of the land. If there's no governor in that land, then the person who collected the child must may spend on the child with that money, but he must, he should tell other people to witness so that no one, um, you know, there's always people to witness that he hasn't taken the money and stolen it, basically. Okay? That he spent the money on the child. Um, if there was no money found, and there is a waqf, like we just studied in the beginning of this class, or something similar established for the child, then the expense is taken from that. If not, it's taken from Baytul Mal. So as we know, the trust or the Baytul Mal, if there's a Muslim country, there used, used to be basically a large uh, you know, trust where uh, Muslim money goes into, and that's used for the general fund. Okay? If that doesn't exist, and that generally doesn't exist, then wealthy Muslims in the community must pay for the child's needs. Wealthy Muslims in the community. It's not compulsory upon the person from the child to pay for it. Yeah? It's good enough that he's taking care of them, yeah? The wealthy Muslims have to pay for it, for the child's needs. And that's generally the most important details of uh, al-Uqh. Inshallah. Now what we're going to do, we're going to go through the next section of Tuqh. But um, sadly, like I said, we don't have much. It's very hard to do a whole uh, explanation of Farah, of inheritance of Tuqh. We need to draw schedules and uh, go into math and stuff like that. So we're just going to read through it, inshallah. I'll read the Arabic, so I'll read the English until we finish, inshallah ta'ala. And then we'll stop at Nikah. So Abu Shuja Al-Fatiha says, Kitab al Faraidi wal So he says, uh, the book of inheritance, basically. And um, subhanAllah, the science of inheritance in Islam is one of the uh, most important sciences. In some ahadith, the Prophet mentions that this is the first science that would be forgo forgotten, that people would abandon this science. Okay? And subhanAllah, it's not very hard. And a lot of scholars, you find that they actually specialize in inheritance. They're very good at that, subhanAllah. So uh, in a few, uh, in a year or so, you can actually master this, this section of the and it's very interesting because there's certain, um, just certain, you know, um, if you've got a mass also, you know, it helps, subhanAllah, there's certain rulings and ways to basically distribute money and different um, cases and um, uh, basically, um, you know, um, things that could happen. Once you master them, it's pretty easy. Uh, generally, um, the way you study this is that there, there's um, people who can inherit it, inherit people who can't inherit. There um, are people who inherit different uh, portions of money according to different circumstances. The people who don't, the people who inherit uh, whatever is left, okay, people inherit only with certain uh, circumstances. And then how much they inherit it all depends on different conditions that you'd study one by one. Once you take all of that into consideration, uh, then let's say you have um, the money, you would split that money into shares, okay, according to certain numbers that you would use, and then that number, according to how much percent they would they would earn, you split the shares amongst them, and it works like that basically. Then if the, if the shares are more or less than they deserve, then it's redistributed again, and there's you know a lot of different details that you go into in the book of inheritance of Farah. So it's, it's very interesting and actually very nice to study. Inshallah, inshallah, in the future we have a separate class for that inshallah ta'ala. Uh, but that's generally how it works. Um, Abu Shuja al-Hamza says, وَالْوَارِثُونَ So he's talking about people who inherit first. وَالْوَارِثُونَ مِنَ الْرِجَالِ عَشَرَةً الْإِبْنُ وَابْنُ الْإِبْنِ وَإِنْ سَفَلْ وَالْأَبْ وَالْجَدُّ وَإِنْ عَلَى وَالْأَقْ وَابْنُهُ وَإِنْ تَرَاخَيَا وَالْعَمْهُ وَابْنُهُ وَإِنْ تَبَعَدَا وَالزَّوْجُ there are ten males to inherit. Oh, no, no. There are ten males to inherit. A son, a son's son, however low. The father, the father's 
father, however high, a brother, a brother's son, however low, a paternal uncle, a paternal uncle's son, however low, the husband and the male who sleeps with the Okay. These men inherit according to certain conditions. Okay. But why is that when Nisa is Sabron? Uh Bintu Libni, Wal Ummu, Wal Jadda, Wain Alat, Al Uhtu was Zojat Wal Matika. There are seven females who inherit a daughter, son's daughter, the mother, a grandmother, however high, a sister, a wife, and a female who frees the people. Okay. So also these people have their own conditions. Um and then he says, Now in uh basically in inheritance, some people their condition to inherit is that other people don't exist. Okay? Uh, for example, if there's a son, the closer son to the inheritor that prevents all the people underneath him. The son of the son and the son of the son of the son, they don't inherit if the son's there. Okay? So uh, the same thing, uh, if the father's there, the father of the father, you know, so basically there's people who prevent other people to inherit. Okay? So he's saying now, he mentioned the men and the ladies, and they all have their own conditions. Now he's saying the people who uh, basically no one can prevent them from inheriting are as zawjan wal abawan wa walad as Five inheritors can never inherit. Husband, the wife, the father, the mother. So no one can prevent these people from inheriting. inheriting. Okay. Woman la yarithu bihad al abdu wal nam al abdu. والمدبر وأم الولد والمكاتب والقاتل والمرتد أهل للتين. Seven members inherited any first son, slave, slave who will be freed on his master's death. Female slave who was born a child for a master, the slave who was purchased into freedom, the murderer who killed the deceased, an apostate, and members of other religions. Okay. So uh, these people, they could never inherit no matter what. Uh, slaves, because they don't own. Um, uh, of course, even if they are to be freed upon their master's death. Um, and then, it's, uh, uh, um, of course, um, uh, so a female slave who has a born child for the master, like we just mentioned in the last class. Um, uh, and then uh, the slave who is purchasing the same thing. So different slaves, okay? As I said, the murderer. In the Shafi'i Madhab, anyone who killed another person, who was the, the reason for someone else dying, cannot inherit. Even if that reason was Islamic. Let's say, for example, um, someone uh, uh, was uh, in charge of, you know, certain, um, executing certain rules of other people, and, uh, you know, they were the reason for another person to die. They can't hear it. Uh, if someone uh, was engaged in Islamic, in, in, in like a war or something, and person, someone's attacking you, and it's a Muslim, but they're attacking you, can't hear it. Prophet says, the, the killer cannot inherit anything from the person they kill. In other madahib, that's only if you kill someone unjustly. In the Shafi'i madahib, no matter how, you don't inherit. Yeah, yes. And then he says, uh, uh, an apostate and people of other religions. So, uh, if you're from a different religion, you can't inherit from the person. If some, if you have a non-Muslim relative, for example, and you're Muslim, millions and billions, you can't uh, inherit them. You can't take anything from them. Yeah? That's the ruling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we don't pay attention to modern fatawa that say, oh, in order to give Muslims upper hand, they can inherit it. Father is Christian, no. they die. They can't take no. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um. Um. No. So then he says, "Wa akrabu al He says, "Universal are people who don't have uh, specific portions of inheritance. Uh, a third." Half, uh, okay, uh, uh, a fourth. The people who take the rest of the money take the rest of the money. So, in inheritance, 
you find some people have specific amounts, but some people will just take the rest of the money. Okay? He says, وأقرب العصبات, he's going to talk about them now. الابن ثم ابنه ثم الأب ثم أبوه ثم الأخ لأب والأم ثم الأخ لأب ثم الأخ للأب والأم والأم ثم ابن الأخ للأب والأم ثم ابن الأخ للأب ثم العم على هذا الترتيب ثم ابنه فإن عدمت العصبات نعم فالمولى المعتق Then he says, وَالثُّمُنُ فَرْضُ الزَّوْجَةِ وَالزَّوْجَاتِ مَعَ الْوَلَدِ وَأَوَّلَدُ الْإِبْنِ Six shares are mentioned in the Quran. One half, one quarter, one eighth, two thirds, one third, and one fifth. After that? The eighth? What, uh, and the eighth? One eighth is a big thing. One half, one quarter, one eighth. Yeah, after that, what's after that? One half. So one half is the obligatory share of the five. A daughter, son's daughter, full sister, consanguine sister, and the husband when no children are present. Mm -hmm. One quarter is the obligatory share for two. The husband when there's an immediate descendant or son's descendant, and one or more wives provided an immediate descendant or son's descendant is not present. One eighth, one eighth is the obligatory share for one or more wives provided an immediate child or son's descendant is present. Okay. for the Arba al Bintain. وبنتي الابن والاختين من الاب والام والاختين من الاب. Two thirds. Two thirds is the obligatory share for four. One, two or more daughters, two or more daughters of a direct son, two or more full sisters, and four, two or more consanguine sisters. والثلث فرض اثنين الام اذا لم تحجب وهو للاثنين وصعدا من الاخوة والاخوات من ولد الام. One third is the obligatory share for two. Number one, the mother provided she is not partially completed. Number two, two or more uterine siblings. والسدس <laughs> وهو فرض الأب مع الولد أو ولد الابن وفرض الجد عند عدم الأب وفرض واحد من ولد وفرض الواحد من ولد الأم. One sixth is the obligatory share for seven. Number one, the mother is an immediate descendant, son's descendant, or two or more siblings are present. Number two, the paternal grandmother, provided the mother is not present. Number three, the son's daughter, provided the immediate daughter is present. Number four, the consanguine sister, provided the full sister is present. Number five, father provided an immediate descendant for son's descendant is present. Number six, the paternal grandfather, if the father is absent. Number seven, the mother's child, if the child has no siblings. Okay. He says, <laughs> يسقط ولد الأب والأم مع الثلاثة الابن وابن الابن والأب ويسقط ولد الأب بهؤلاء الثلاثة وبالأخ من الأب والأم. The mother's presence causes the grandmother to be omitted. The father's presence causes the grandfather to be omitted. The mother's child is omitted in the presence of one of four: a son, 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 the father, or the paternal grandfather. Full brother is omitted in the presence of one of three: a son, a son, son, or the father. The father's son is omitted by those three by the presence of the full brother. Okay. Okay, let's uh cut on read this book. So I I'm it's wrong with all the slides. Um okay. okay. He then says so basically he just mentioned all the people who inherit and don't inherit. 
Okay. Um, brothers who partially inherit the inheritance of their sisters are four, son, 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 a full brother, and a consanguine brother. Brothers who inherit while their sisters do not are four, paternal uncles, sons of paternal uncles, sons of four brothers, and universal inheritors, one freedom. Okay. So Abu Shaja here, he just mentioned basically who inherits, he doesn't. Okay. Details of that, like I said, should be studied. And uh, yani, uh, I prefer to study in a separate book. So there's many books in fiqh that are written just for inheritance. And that way we could draw, like you said, schedules and stuff. And uh, yani, it's it's really interesting and uh, it's very beneficial to understand and to know. Uh, every Muslim should know, should have an idea of it, um, inshallah ta'ala. So inshallah, one of the um, future things we can do once we finish this book is we could, we could study specific um, sections of there or, or, or specific books that, you know, um, that uh, you know, address a certain um, uh, topic. Yeah. He then talks about um, al wasiyah So um, he says, What a juzu wasiyah to be maalumi will majhuli will majudi will madum, what he mean at Hulif. The inzada, Mukhifa ala ijazat il waratha, or at a juzu wasiyah to the warik in illa and ujizaha, bakil waratha, sihil wasiyah to me, fully malik in bad of an apple. لكل متملك في وفي سبيل الله لكل ولكل متملك وفي سبيل الله. It is permissible to bequeath something as justified or not, aren't they cooking or not? Testament, testamentary bequests are only permissible when their total bequests or equal to one third of the estate. The validity, the validity of bequests exceeding one third is dependent upon the consent of it is not permissible to bequeath something to one of the heirs unless the other heirs permit it. Bequests are valid from anyone who is mature as a child might to anyone who can own property or for the sake of Allah the Most. So basically, a person has money and they want to write in their will that this money will go to this person, this became this person. The Prophet ﷺ says that that can only be done. Uh, in regards to uh, a third of your wealth, okay, and uh, that comes from a famous hadith where Sa'd radiallahu anhu Allah, he got ill and he had a lot of money. So, Ya Rasulullah, the only person who's going to inherit me is my daughter, one person. Uh, so he wanted to give his money to me. Like Allah said to him, uh, no. He said, I'll give half my money. He said, no. He said, I'll give less. I'll give less. I'll give less. He kept on going down and down. Until he said, I'll give a third. The Prophet said, okay, a third is okay. A third is a third is a lot. A third is a lot. That's why some scholars dislike going up to the third. They mentioned that in, in many books. Um, uh, then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He said, Leave your, you know, um, your offsprings and people who inherit you, uh, well, uh, you know, um, wealthy and rich, is better than leaving them poor, asking other people for money. Yeah, that's better. That's more beloved in Islam. So, um, Subhanallah, you know, in a lot of uh, cultures, you know, the person that feel like the money I have worked for this money, I'm not going to share it with my kids. They have to work for it. You know, that's that's against the Islamic idea of. Uh, I think Allah subhanAllah, don't be greedy. Allah Ta'ala give it, he's the one who put it in your hand. Uh, you know, um, subhanAllah, uh, why not share it with the closest people to you, your family? And the best sadaqah is sadaqah uh, on your family. So, from this, Imam Shafi took that it's not permissible to go over a third. Unless what? The people who inherit you all agree. When do they agree? After you pass away. Yeah? So he said, yeah, the money is it's kept and then pass away and they all agree, then it can be Israel. The same thing when it comes into giving money to someone who already inherits you. So Allah Ta'ala gave them a percentage. You want to give them more? Everyone else has to agree. Okay? Everyone else has to agree. And um, uh, only if they agree, a person can, can get that money. Even if the person wrote in their will, that this person gets half my money, you know, he deserves it all. A lot of people, yeah, a lot of cultures, 
uh, people use their will to take revenge on their kids, from the family, and stuff like that. That's un Islam. Yeah. Allah Ta'ala gives everyone percentage. And every one of the people are able to stop other people taking from their own percentage. So if you agree, you're giving from your part to that person. So Alhamdulillah, um, Allah Ta'ala has, has, you know, um, as Prophet said, Inna Allah a'ata kulla di wa uh, 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 Allah has given every person who inherits their percentage. فَلَا وَصِيَةَ لِوَالِ So there's no wasiya. Okay, there's no, um, nothing to be prescribed to someone who already has you. That's the hadith. لَا وَصِيَةَ لِوَالِ And Allah عَطَى كُلَّ ذِي حَقٍ حَقٍ Allah gave the haq, the right of everyone, to uh, the person who deserves that right. So there's no wasiya to be given to someone who already inherits you. In the Shafi'i Matab, it means unless the other inheritors agree. So that's them, that's them, um, as he said here, that's them, um, basically giving up, uh, uh, giving up their right now. Uh, then he says, وَتَصِحُ الْوَصِيَ إِلَى مَنْ اجْتَمَعْ فِيهِ خَمْسُ قِصَادٍ الإسلام والبلوغ والعقل والحرية والأمانة. It is valid to appoint someone executor if he possesses the following five qualities. One must be a Muslim, mature, of sound mind, free, and selfless. Okay, so alhamdulillah, these are uh, conditions of someone uh, who uh, has appointed something from another person. And uh, Generally, these are the same conditions we've been reading and hearing about in most of the sections. So, alhamdulillah, it's a very quick um, study of the section of, of Buyur, of buying and selling. Uh, alhamdulillah, in fiqh. Um, when did we start? The beginning of the year. Yes, the beginning of the year. So, um, uh, in January, I think. So, alhamdulillah, um, it was about... Um, Four months or something. Alhamdulillah, that we covered. Um, inshallah ta'ala. The next section will go slowly, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and inshallah ta'ala, um, so we will do nikah as a, as a specific set of classes. Then we'll do nikah and talaq, so marriage and divorce. Then and we'll go into the other section, same thing. So we'll do, like, for example, um, the fiqh of um, of, of hunting, eating, that will also be specific, inshallah ta'ala, and then the rest of the, the classes, inshallah ta'ala, and that way, uh, inshallah, if anyone wants to join those classes, they can also benefit, inshallah ta'ala, and um, hopefully, within the ta'ala, um, we don't take too long. I don't know, does anyone want to take a test, want to have a test first before we start the next section? Is there something we want? Uh, it's asking each other. Um, so, um, yes, do we want to have a test for the next class or not? Or do we want to delay it a bit? No, how do we want to do it? Yeah, or the whole thing, the whole thing in the beginning. Uh, uh, multiple choice. Yeah. We'll look into it and we'll discuss in the, in the group, inshallah. But if everyone's happy, we could, we could take a small test, inshallah. Then, um, then khalas will be one to the end of the book, inshallah. Uh, when we finish. Yeah, that's the way, that's the way out of it. Yes, but how would you, you can go for the money? For example, if you have an interest, um, uh, no, if they gave you money, what do you mean they give you money? Like, uh, like uh, in the will, they said that they yeah. gave you money. Yeah, but you didn't inherit from them. They gave you money, yeah. So they tell, them, you tell them, give me money, give me money while you're alive, or, you know, or, or, you know or, uh, but don't inherit. You, you can't be given your specific percentage that we mentioned, can't be given to you in this way. Why accept it? Just give it to the other sibling or person. Then, yani, it depends, it depends because yeah, in a non-Muslim, it's a whole different category because um, you have um, sometimes 
to the many people, for the Muslims and the and it's a whole different category. But yani, it's, uh, uh, it's it's tough, like I said, that's why it's best to tell them plan. If you want to give me money, give it to me now. Because I'm not gonna take anything on you. And uh, inshallah, the best thing is to actually convince them to set this time for the fatwa, and then you inherit everything. Everything you're attached to, even other people's percentage you inherit as well. And there's so many people, they before the parents pass away, the last moment, they take it down. And last moment, so, and it's everything. Not that much, yeah. Can't go over a third. You, you can't go over a third of their money, yeah. So they say half my money goes to you, you can't take half. Yeah, you can't take more than a third. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll need to revise that. Yeah. Yeah. What's wrong with the message? In, 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 they say in, 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 in the masjid, yeah? the doors of the masjid. Yeah. Uh, but the hadith is talking about uh, there's a man who came for a certain time. He didn't lose the money in the masjid. But what did he do? He lost it outside the masjid and he went into the masjid looking for the item. And basically, it was the hadith says he entered the masjid in a very aggressive way. He says, Man died al al He said, who, that, you know, who saw that the camel that was, you know, that, that has like a red mark on its neck? It's a very expensive camel. Who found it? Prophet Sam said, "In the messages, lam, lam, uh, it weren't made. Messages weren't made for this." And he, he told him off. He told him that not to ask for this in that, in that man in the masjid. But um, so uh, outside the masjid, why did they say the masjid? In fiqh, they say you, you ask what you, you advertise at the masjid because people leave the masjid. When they leave the masjid, then that's where most people will come. Most people will gather, basically, especially in Muslim countries. This, and not only the masjid, yeah, also other places like. The, su the supermarket, shopping centers now, for example. Yeah. Now we could use these groups. For example, you have a group on Facebook, on WhatsApp or something uh, in that area. Springvale group, um, you know, uh, it was a lost at school, school group or something. Those groups would be definitely something that we consider to advertise on. If you send a message uh, every month, for example, if you send a message every now and then, then that would, um, that would be significant for advertising. So it changes according to the circumstances of time. Awesome. So shall I stop here? And let's see everyone. So now I said, I'm going to do it. I should do it. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to stop it.